Today on Free Field Training, we're talking about being armed and suited. Specifically, if you're a professional who is doing a job that requires you to be carrying a firearm and a bunch of other tools, but also to have to wear a suit and a tie to work. There's lots of law enforcement security professionals that fall into that category. There's also a lot of people that I think could get a lot of this out of this as concealed carry permit holders or professionals who work in an office or professional environment where they have to wear a shirt and a tie or a suit and they also want to be able to carry a firearm in their day-to-day -day life. So stick around for all of that. I would also like to thank Tactically Suited, who's the sponsor for this video. They gave me a bunch of stuff to use as examples for this video. I've used Tactically Suited's products for a couple of years now. I really like their tactical dress pants. More on the stuff that they have coming up in the future. If you want links to any of the stuff that I'm using in this video, links are going to be down below in the description. So, there's two basic routes that you can go with carrying a firearm and wearing a suit as far as the suit and the suit jacket, your pants and your shoes and all of that goes. Uh, the first is to do separates. And what separates is, is you go to your, your Kohl's or your JCPenney or whatever, and you get a black suit normally because they're gonna be like either black or dark blue suits. And in the type of work that we're talking about doing, most people go with a black suit because you know black goes with everything. And we're cops and security guards, we love black stuff all the tactical black gear. So you go get a black suit and you buy, if you're going to wear a firearm inside the waistband, you buy the suit pants a little large and then you buy the jacket a little large. And this is the cheap way to get in. It's what a lot of people do is they'll buy a cheap suit to wear to work or they'll buy several cheap suits to wear to work and they'll take them all to a tailor with the equipment that they're going to wear and they'll have the tailor change the suit in order to fit them. So when you do that, if you're going to go that route, what you want to do is buy everything a bit larger than normal unless you wear your pistol outside the waistband. In which case, you want to buy the pants the normal size and buy the jacket one size larger. Not necessarily longer, but larger. So if you're a 38 inch shoulders, you want to want a 39 or a 40 inch shoulder, maybe even a 40 or a 41 or a 42 inch shoulder. You want a specific, just a larger coat so that way you can more easily conceal the stuff that's in it. Now, the other route is to go and buy a bespoke suit. So a suit designed specifically for you. And this you do it in the reverse. Uh, you contact the company that is going to produce the suit. They'll send you normally a fit sheet and you take that fit sheet to your tailor and the tailor measures you and then the company makes the suit to those specifications. I've done this both ways. Uh, for many years, especially when I first started, I didn't have a lot of money and I bought a suit from JCPenney and I bought you know the suit jacket a little large and I brought it to my tailor and I had a tailor so that way I could wear it with a firearm and it wouldn't look too goofy. Uh, the problem with this is very often you get weird bulges or you get seams that don't seem right. Uh, if you don't have a really, really good tailor, very often you end up with problems with it. And the issue with that is you buy this suit, you spend maybe $300, $350 on it by the time you're all done per suit jacket and pair of pants. And then if one of them gets messed up because it wasn't tailored right or it doesn't look right, then you're out all of that money. Uh, the flip side of that is to go to a company that makes suits and get a fit sheet, have the suit specifically made to that fit sheet. Now you can do that with a lot of companies, but most of them don't specifically tailor to people who are carrying a firearm. So what you'll do is you'll go to your tailor, you get the fit sheet, and then you just add a little bit to the waistline so it looks to the suit company that you're a little fatter. This can work. Now what Tactically Suited specializes in is suits, and pants and vests that are designed for people who are going to be carrying a firearm every day. So instead of having to buy something and fit it to your specifications or have the specifications fit to what you're trying to do, you send pictures of them, of you wearing the stuff that you're going to normally, the stuff you're normally carrying at work, front, back, and sides. You go to a tailor, you have yourself measured, and they make the, the suit to fit your specifications. That's the suit that I'm wearing right now for this video. Uh, unlike going to JCPenney, the other things it gives you is a, a significantly better suit. You can get a good wool dress coat, good wool pants. You can get it set up either for uh, winter wear of the suit or summer wear of the suit. There's a lot of pockets on the interior that allows you to keep equipment. And also, it's designed specifically around the firearm by people 
by tailors who also carry firearms for a living, who understand what it is that you're going to be trying to do with the suit, and they can see in front of them, oh, this is how he's carrying the gun, that's the position he carries it in, and that's why I need to bulge this out a little this way, cut this in a little bit that way. I'm really happy with the results. Uh, surprisingly, this doesn't cost significantly more in their base model suits than going and getting that JCPenney suit. So if you have 100 or 200 extra dollars per set, so per jacket and pants to get a suit, instead of spending that money on a tailor and maybe having to mess it up, it's a much better option to go with a bespoke suit company like Tactically Suited and have the suit made for you so that way you know what you're getting. Uh, the, the further issue with it is that when you buy a coat from JCPenney and you have it altered, there's no warranty on that. No one's going to fix it for you if it doesn't come out right. And that's a big thing about Tactically Suited. That's why I've always liked their pants and why I'm very happy with the suit coat. These also come lined significantly better than what you would ever expect from JCPenney. The, the lining is fantastic on the inside. Lots of pockets inside. Pass-throughs, pen pockets. Pockets on both sides of the jacket instead of just one. And actual functional pockets. Functional pockets on the outside of the suit where you can stash stuff in a hurry if you have to. The pants that come with them are the same way. Legit functional pockets. Deep pockets that you can actually fit your hand into. Not little slats on the side that you can barely drop a pen into. The suit's really awesome. And it does a great job of concealing a firearm. You really don't get bulges and stuff because they're designing the suit jacket and they're cutting it specifically for you. This helps a whole bunch in looking professional if you're going to be in one of those professional environments and fitting in if that's what you're supposed to be doing or if you're testifying not looking like a mope when you walk into court who looks like he's wearing his dad's suit, which is kind of the result that we get a lot with new cops coming in and wearing a suit to court. Now, moving on from there, we have to talk about belt selection and firearm selection and your holster selection because those are really key in being able to conceal a firearm effectively when you're wearing a suit and tie or really anytime you're wearing any clothes. That belt selection, the firearm selection, and the holster selection is what's going to allow you to conceal it and have the tools you need in case things go completely sideways. So let's take a quick look at that. Now, the jacket, of course, you see me wearing here. We'll have to pop this off so that you can see what I'm talking about. But this is the belt that I'm wearing. It's from Core Essentials. It's their gun belt. What it is is a ratcheting belt. So you have on the inside a track, and on this end a little hook system that allows you to ratchet the belt into place and be able to fix everything on yourself so that way you can decide how tight or how loose you want the belt to be. This is huge when you're trying to conceal a firearm, you're trying to tuck it into your body. As you can see here, the ratcheting belt allows me to loosen up if I'm going to be sitting down. It allows me to tighten up if I want to have a lower profile, especially from the front. When you're wearing a suit jacket and you're wearing a firearm, one of the big dead giveaways if you're going to interact with somebody and you're coming up and you're going to you're going to shake their hand is the profile from the side. If you're a lot heavier to one side or the other side, it's a dead giveaway that you're carrying a gun. That's why I always suggest to people, if you're going to be carrying a gun for court, even if you're not wearing a suit coat, even if you're going to, just going to wear the, the shirt and tie and slacks and you're going to be carrying a gun and throwing a leather jacket over the top of it in the winter or something else, and you don't want people to know you're carrying a gun when you're going to and from court, what you're going to want to do is pick a holster that sucks the gun up into your side. You get too many people that have like a paddle holster on them where the, the pistol is sticking significantly out, or they have what's really a range holster where the gun is straight up and down, it's vertical with your body at 90 degrees, you've got the butt of the gun sticking straight out the side, and it looks funny even under a heavy winter jacket or a wool coat. So the holster that I'm using here, this is from Allegiance Holsters, it's an outside the waistband holster that's designed uh, to carry a full-size duty pistol. So this is my Glock 35 with an X300U on it. It is my full-size duty pistol for work, and that's what I always suggest people carry if they're even working a side job. If there's any possibility that you're going to be using your gun in a professional environment, you want the one that you have as much trigger time on as possible, you have as much training on as possible, and you have it in a position where you know where that gun is going to be, and it's 
very similar to what you're using in your normal day-to-day -day life at the job, so that way you're always going to the same place for the gun and you always get the same gun that your little reptile brain is assuming it's gonna get when it goes for a pistol. When you reach for gun, you want the gun that you're used to reaching for at work. And that's why I try to carry my duty pistol as much as possible. If I'm not carrying my Glock 35, I'm carrying something that's very uh, analogous to it. I'll carry a Glock 22 with the same light, or I'll carry a Glock 27 if I'm going to go even smaller than that, and I'm going to carry it in the same place if I can. So a lot of people really like this type of thing when they're wearing a suit, and I always caution people against it. And there's two basic reasons for that. The first one is that we're going to carry this because it looks better if we have to take the coat off, but it's a lot, a lot less effective in doing the job of a holster. Uh, while the angle does help with concealment a little bit, something like this, very few of these leather holsters with a thumb snap are going to have the capability to use a weapon light on them, like this one. This one is for a Glock 22 from when I first started out on the job. And you can't have a weapon light on it, so you have to take the light off in order to carry the gun. Now you're down your weapon light, or you're going to be carrying a significantly smaller gun in a leather holster because you don't buy it for your duty pistol because it doesn't fit the light or the doggles or whatever you have on it. With a good Kydex holster, I can get exactly what I want for my duty pistol for what I'm using at work. And it might not look as cool when I take the suit off. It might not be as stylish, but it's definitely doing a lot more of the actual job that I'm doing. So while I won't get down on anybody for wearing a leather holster if they're a lawyer and they're going to carry a gun to their office every day because they're worried about weirdos that come in their neighborhood and they're more worried about the way they look when they interact with clients than anything else, there's nothing wrong with a leather holster. But if you're doing this professionally and you're going to try to carry a duty pistol that's got a weapon light on it and you're used to using, say, like a Safari Land holster with a UBL or another duty holster and they're all polymer now, you're not going to want to go from polymer to this. There's also a different feeling with the gun coming out of the holster with a leather holster than there is with a Kydex holster or another type of polymer holster that people are using for duty pistols. And while I have nothing against the way this feels coming out of the holster, it's different and we want to minimize that difference anytime that we're actually working in an environment where we might need the gun. Another thing to think about when we're wearing a suit is the size of the equipment that we're actually having to carry and what it can do for us. So we want to be careful with how much of the equipment that we're using we go full on with. Now I obviously can't carry a Streamlight Stinger or a Pelican 7070R and a Glock 35 and a full size set of handcuffs and blah 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 blah. What I can do is I can supplement with a smaller piece of equipment that does substantially similar things for me, but it's a lot easier to carry. So we're gonna look at the lights that we carry first. Now obviously on duty I carry a Streamlight Stinger. There's also people out there that, that love the Pelican 7070R. There's lots of good lights out there. What I found is that these little single AA and single CR123 flashlights work a lot better when you're trying to dress up. Now there's obviously other brands of these. These are just the two that I find myself using most as backup lights, and a backup light is generally what I carry as a handheld light when I'm wearing a suit. Now if I'm gonna be wearing a suit, it's not normally gonna be in an environment where I'm gonna come into things that are dark a lot of the time. I'm not wearing a suit in a warehouse where the power's out very much. I'm not wearing a suit out on a street corner generally. Now if you're gonna do some sort of close protection detail, that might be where you want a smaller gun but a larger light. These are the things that you have to think about on your own and decide for yourself. But for me, and I think for most people that are gonna be carrying a suit, these two types of things are gonna work very well. So I've got examples of each here. This is the Olight M1T Raider. It's an example of a CR123, a uh, single CR123 flashlight. And what I like about these is that CR123s, I keep them in my bag in my car, so I know I always have them. And they interchange with the batteries on my weapon light and on other lights that I use at work. In fact, it only carries one means if I do have to go to Walgreens to buy another battery, it's not the end of the world. It's going to cost me 10 bucks to get you know, two of these. So it's not going to hurt too much if I have to do that, but I know I normally carry these because I buy these in bulk. What, one thing you have to think about with a flashlight is the operation of it. There's lots of lights out there, and for EDC lights, a lot of people really like lights that have a, a head switch that allows you to cycle through a bunch of different functions. I always suggest people don't do that. You want a light that's just large enough to stick out of both ends, the palm of your hand. Now, that's going to depend 
on your hand so that you can use it as kind of an improvised Kubaton type device if you need to get somebody off of you in a hurry. That's the type of thing that you're trained up to do. But you also want to have a clip on it so that you can just clip it to pants and you don't need another pouch hanging off your belt. That's going to help you with slimming down the look of that waistline when you're meeting a client or when people are seeing you with a client. And you're also going to want a very simple operation. So with your little handheld flashlights and with most backup lights, you're going to want something that has both a momentary on, so you push and it doesn't click, but the light comes on, and also a solid click on mode. And that's pretty much it. If it's got maybe two modes where you can you can get a lower setting, a higher setting, and then a lower setting, that's all right. As long as that high setting comes on first, then you have to purposely go find that low setting. But what you don't want is one where you have a light head and you push a button and it comes on low and then you hold it and it ramps up to high. That's not something that's going to be particularly useful in a dynamic environment and that's really what we're worried about using this type of light for. This is another example of a light that I use for this purpose and I've used for backup light for many years. And this is a Thrunite 1A V3. We'll put obviously links to all these down below in case you're interested. This is a single AA battery flashlight, which means it's really easy to find batteries for this, uh, especially in an urban environment. Obviously, that's, you know, I'm a cop in around Chicago, so urban environment is what we're talking about most of the time for me. I can normally find, beg, borrow, steal, or scrounge a AA battery pretty much everywhere. Uh, the advantage of this is that these are thinner which makes them easier to fit in your pockets, especially if you gain some weight over the last couple of months and now your suit doesn't fit as well or your pants don't fit as well or after the holidays here. Uh, the same things apply. You're gonna want a, po a pocket clip so you can just attach it to your pocket somewhere to one of the pockets inside the suit and be able to get it out in a relative hurry. You're gonna wanna make sure that that clip holds enough of the light out of the top of the pocket where when you have this in a pocket, you can easily withdraw it and you're not having to dig down into the pocket and get the light out. And obviously this one leaves you a good solid inch on the end of the light and this one leaves you a little bit of space, a little deeper carry, but at least a little bit of space to be able to, to grab hold of that light head and get it out and get it in your hand and ready to go. Moving on from lights, something that a lot of people don't think about as being you know, a tactical requirement is shoes. And while you don't have to spend a significant amount of money on shoes, you don't have to spend four or $500, you don't have to go get Allen Edmonds or anything in order to get good shoes to use for work uh, when you're wearing a suit and a tie. There's things you have to think about that dress shoes don't always apply perfectly to. One is that if you're in a professional environment, you, you need to look the part, but if you're working security or your law enforcement in a professional environment, how well these shoes work is really more important. I generally don't like, you know, kind of square-toed shoes or stitching on the top of the shoe, but I'll tell you something. These shoes are really light and they look the part and they have lots of traction. And that's really what's important with a shoe if you're going to be wearing it with a suit and you're going to be doing some sort of law enforcement or security work. It's important that shoes be comfortable on your feet, so you're going to want to make sure you have a good cushion sole. I like to have a gel insert into most of the dress shoes that I wear because my feet and dress shoes don't get along really well anymore and probably never really did. Uh, you want a, a good lace-up shoe so you can keep it nice and tight on your foot. You're not going to want a loafer or something that you're just sliding your foot into. And although it's okay to have this false Goodyear welt all the way around, what you want to look for is a shoe with lots of traction, especially traction for wet environments. In an urban setting, especially inside of office buildings or courthouses, you get lots of tile floors, concrete floors. If they get wet, you want to make sure you're going to have traction on that wet surface. Obviously, if you're a detective, you're going to want larger lugs if you're going to be out in the field, you're going to be out interviewing people, but you can also get slip-on rubber, rubber covers for dress shoes that are more applicable for them, especially in the wintertime. But the type of tread that you see here, what I really like about these is that there's tread at the nose of the shoe and there's tread at the back of the shoe. So when you're on a tile floor and you put your heel down, what's hitting is tread in the back, not one sharp piece of rubber. So you're getting, the water is getting displaced by the sipes in the tread of the shoe and that's pushing out the water from the outside and giving you traction even on wet floors. It's one of its little secret sauce item that people don't talk about but I think is really important and people 
underappreciate when they talk about dress shoes. Now there's ancillary stuff to all of this that you may or may not be required to carry, things like a radio. Uh, radios, our big problem is that they're not exactly designed to conceal. This is the old HT-1000 from me at work. This is the one that I carry at court most. I take the shoulder mic off of it and carry this around. And what you're gonna find with radios is that there's three ways basically to carry them. Uh, one is if you're gonna be standing and for concealment, you generally wanna put it at your back. And what that allows us to do, if you put it at your back, is again, keep that slim profile up front where it doesn't look like you're carrying a bunch of stuff. And as long as you leave your suit jacket open, you don't have any weird bulges in the back because your suit generally flops out a little bit in the back. That's great if you're standing. The problem is if you're sitting, let's say you're gonna sit in court waiting for somebody or you're gonna be in a car, let's say you're doing some sort of dignitary protection detail, you don't wanna be sitting on your radio in the car. That is really, really gonna hurt. So the other way to do it is to put it on your side, counter to the gun. So you're gonna put it on the side, opposite your pistol, but at the same position. So if your pistol bulges a little bit, you have an, an equal bulge on the other side. So you look a little fatter, but you don't look out of place. And we're okay, in, in an environment where someone's paying us a bunch of money to protect somebody, I'm okay, or go to court, I'm okay with looking a little fatter as long as the, ca the cash is green and I'm not giving up what I am if that's what I'm trying to conceal from people is what I'm doing there. Now on the flip side, in a security environment where you're gonna wear a suit because let's say maybe you're managing a contract or you're doing a consulting job with uh, security for a large operation, you're gonna wear a suit to go do that consulting job or to manage that operation. You may wanna just clip your radio to a pocket uh, two things this does is, one, it's a lot more comfortable to just clip a radio to a pocket. It's easier to access, and then you look like you work there. And that does help sometimes, especially with a consulting gig where you might have a visitor pass, but if you're carrying a radio around, it looks like you're, you're actually there doing work. You're not just you know visiting Aunt Betty who works on the 15th floor. As far as carrying a badge, I know a lot of dignitary protection people don't even bother carrying a badge, especially in the private industry. For law enforcement, very often we're required to carry a badge, and what a lot of guys will do is they'll clip their badge on their belt in front of their pistol. And while this is useful if you're wearing a shirt and a tie and a pair of dress pants, because it keeps it visible there and you don't want people freaking out that you have a gun, uh, if you're wearing a suit, oftentimes, and you need to stay concealed, it's better not to put it there because any flash of the coat open is unlikely to show a pistol. But if you have a badge stuck in front of it, people will definitely see that bright, shiny metal up front. So my preference for that and what I suggest people try is to make sure that you have a suit that's got a large enough pocket where you can put your badge holder in a suit pocket. So if something kicks off or you see something starting to kick off or you're gonna get involved in a situation uh, when you're dressed nicely, you can pull your badge holder out, pull out the chain, and throw that puppy around your neck and now you're fairly well identified, at least from the front to people. Another option, again, if you're working a consultancy job or you're working a security job where you want people to know your security but you have to be well-dressed because of the type of work that you're talking about. You can get lanyards, uh, custom lanyards made up, or you can get stock lanyards from most uniform supplies that are just a black or a yellow lanyard that either says police or security up or around it. I always prefer to have one that's actually from the company that I'm representing if I'm representing a company. If not, I'll just wear one that says the police or it'll just say the department's name on it so people know it's XYZ Police Department. Oh, I know exactly what that guy's here for. Another tool that can be really useful on the job is handcuffs. And the problem with wearing handcuffs is that they're heavy, they're difficult to conceal. You can either flip them over your belt, which I know a lot of people do in order to keep your normal Smith & Wesson or Peerless handcuffs with you all the time without having to have a holder that bulges out more and is uncomfortable when you're sitting, if you have it around your back. Uh, one option is to have a dual carrier where your spare mag or your pistol also has a handcuff holder in it. Uh, what I prefer to do is use zip cuffs uh, these zip cuffs from uh, Millspec Plastics here, 
They're really light, they're really thin. You can just put them into a suit coat pocket. They pretty much disappear in that pocket. They don't make weird bulges. It doesn't add a lot of weight to what you're doing. And they're very, very easy to deploy should you need them. And they're very easy to put away if you find out later that you don't. Uh, these are pretty much my go-to when working a security job because as you've heard me say before in a bunch of other videos, if I'm not being paid by the government, I'm not handcuffing and arresting people if I can get away without doing that with just talking them away from a situation. But it's always good to have that option with you and zip cuffs can be a great advantage in those situations. And especially because if you do end up handcuffing someone and you're handing them off to the local police department or whoever's on duty that day, you don't have to worry about getting your handcuffs back. Put the zip cuffs on them and you're like, gone. I don't need those cuffs back. Cut them off. They're done. No problem. I don't have to worry about them and they're cheap enough that I don't have to worry about, oh, do I really want to use these zip cuffs? They're a couple bucks. Boom. Gone. Don't have to worry about it anymore. Now that's my tips and tricks for being armed and suited. Now I want to hear what yours are. Please put them down in the comments down below. I want to know about all of the stuff that I missed or forgot or what you guys use or some things, some tips and tricks or the secret sauce into doing this type of work that you guys have out there in the real world that you found given the circumstances that you're in. You know, what works for you? What position do you put this stuff in? And how has that worked out in your day-to-day -day life working and being armed and suited? Uh, links for everything that you see here and coupon codes and all that are down in the description. If you guys are interested in any of it, I highly recommend uh, Tactically Suited's products. It's worked really well for me. I've had this suit actually held off on doing this video for about nine months until I had some time on the suit, had it washed and made sure it was going to stay color fast, made sure that it worked with a bunch of the different pistols that I use and a bunch of the different holsters that I use and that it stayed comfortable and it didn't shrink up on me and all of that. So. Until next week, you guys be safe, take care of each other. Hey, thanks for watching Free Field Training on YouTube. While you're here, check out one of our other videos, or head on over to the Patreon and see how you can get your name put on your videos like these fine folks over here. All the links are in the description, of course. We'll see you guys next time.